So, this seminar is titled Bahamas Weekend Blast with two superstars, Yellowfin Tuna and Queen Snapper. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a Bahamas Weekend Blast focusing on Yellowfin Tuna and Queen Snapper, two completely different fisheries. Not to say when you go to the Bahamas, you're not going to catch a variety of other fish. You certainly will. When you're tuna fishing, I'll almost guarantee you when you're targeting yellowfins that you're also going to catch blackfin tuna. When you're bottom fishing for Queen Snapper, I'll almost guarantee you that somewhere in there you're going to catch some grouper or yellow eyes or silkies. However, our focus again in a limited time frame is to talk about those two key superstars. Because if you go to the Bahamas and you bag a few yellow fins and you box some Queen Snappers, did you have a great trip? Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay, it was a great time. However, to do it successfully and effectively takes proper planning and proper execution. And it's all in the details. It's little things that all add up to make a big, big difference. So first, let's talk about prepping your boat to run over to the islands and what's involved with that. Obviously, chances are you're not going alone. If you are, you're pretty mean because, you know, it's usually pretty easy to find people to go to the Bahamas with you. Okay, so certainly you got to get your buddies ready, you got to get your boat ready. I don't need to tell you all of the safety gear, you're crossing the Gulf Stream over to the islands. The shortest distance is going to be approximately 50 miles if you head to Bimini, and you may go upwards of 100 miles. So keep in mind, all of your safety gear is essential. You know, I, this isn't a safety class, but I can't stress it enough. You know, don't wait for an accident to happen to wish you had a life raft or to wish you had an EPIRB or some kind of personal locator beacon or water, an extra pump. You know, again, accidents happen. We all know that. If you don't have the safety equipment, rent it. Okay, there are places that rent the gear. So really affordable, no excuse. Fuel, bring all of the fuel that you can carry. Okay, because you don't want to have to get fuel in the Bahamas unless you have to get fuel in the Bahamas. It's usually six bucks or so a gallon. Sometimes there's water in the fuel. Sometimes there's no fuel. Okay, has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, there you go. So I'm not fibbing. You know, it'll happen. So you try and go over with as much fuel as you can. Ice, absolutely essential. Sometimes it's very challenging to get ice in the Bahamas. Sometimes it's impossible to get ice in the Bahamas. Has that ever happened to anybody? All right, here we go again. So again, bring your ice. And let me just tell you something. If you're going to the Bahamas for a wild weekend blast, okay, which is going to really be a four-day weekend, you need a lot of ice. Don't think one of those plastic little igloo coolers is going to hold all of your ice for four days. It is not going to happen. I'm telling you this right now. As soon as, by the time you get to the islands, your cooler has no more ice. Okay, from the time you left. So good quality coolers are absolutely essential. I can't stress that enough. We use frigid rigid coolers, but certainly there's a number of quality products on the market. Bring more ice than you think you could even need. Okay, that's really important. Um, the safety we talked about. Again, if you're gonna run over to the islands and target yellowfin tuna and queen snapper, it really isn't gonna be a day trip. You certainly can do it in a day trip, but then that's not what this seminar is. This isn't Bahamas day tripping, because that's what we call it. This is Bahamas weekend blast. So you've got some time, you know, to figure things out and some time to get dialed in, and you're gonna be there for quite some time. So first and foremost, where in the Bahamas are you going? If you would like, pop open your phones, hit Google Maps, and type in Bimini Bahamas, and you will see that this beautiful little island called Bimini pops open. Okay, there's North Bimini and South Bimini. That is the closest island, okay, with customs and immigration to check in, really, to South Florida here. However, another option is Grand Bahama Island. We've all heard of West End, Freeport, Lucaya. That's Grand Bahama Island. Now, which of the two are you going to go to? Well, first of all, let's think about where you're coming from. If you are running over to the Bahamas from, say, Isle Morada, which a lot of guys from the Keys do, they're not going to bypass Bimini and run all the way up to Grand Bahama Island to then turn around and run back down south to fish, to then turn around and go back up north, to then turn around and come back south, etc. They will generally go to Bimini. And then when they are tuna fishing, they will go north from Bimini, and then of course they'll come back to Bimini on their way home. If you're fishing from Miami, 
Hillsborough Inlet, Boca, Boynton, West End is an absolutely awesome option. It's a little bit further. If you've never been to the Bahamas before, Bimini is a great place to start, very easy to get to. Like I said, it's approximately 50 miles. For most of today's high performance center consoles, it's an hour, okay? Maybe an hour and a half, okay? When you're running over at 50 miles an hour. Again, even if you take your time, two hours. Two hours, what's that? That's nothing, it's a, it's a movie. From the time a movie starts till it's over, you're now in the Bahamas, okay? On the other hand, Grand Bahama Island is, of course, a little bit further. At West End, best case scenario, you're looking at around 70 miles. Lukaya, you're looking at around 90 miles. But even 90 miles, when you're running, you know, again, one of these multiple outboard powered high performance center consoles, you know, running 90 miles is three hours, you know, at, at, at the longest three hours. So it's not that far. So you have to decide where are you going. You also, that decision is also going to be based on primarily what are your target species. In other, in other words, we know we're looking for queen snapper. We know we're looking for yellowfin tuna. Okay, does either have a heavier preference for you of the two? By show of hands, who'd prefer to catch yellowfin tuna over queen snapper? Who would prefer queen snapper over yellowfin tuna? The vast majority, why are you raising your hand, Micah? You'd rather catch a snapper than a tuna? Okay, so the vast majority, of course, are after the tunas. Okay, so if you are seriously after the yellowfin tuna, if you had your option, I would definitely go to West End, and we're gonna talk about, I should say, Grand Bahama Island, and I'm gonna talk about why in detail in a second. So, in preparation of our trip, we know that everyone who is on the boat with us needs, number one, a valid passport, okay, crossing over to the Bahamas. Once we arrive in the Bahamas, we need to show up at Customs and Immigration with all of our paperwork, and it's just some basic forms that spell out some information about the boat, information about the passengers that are on the boat. Yes, you are allowed to bring a firearm into the Bahamas. You've got to you know, jot it down, all the information, how many rounds you're carrying. If, if you bring a firearm on a center console, let's say, maybe check it at the police station. Is that something new? Yeah. Don't tell them you have three guns. Any, any house, okay? Yeah. yeah. So, no AR-15s. Let's get that straight. Okay, any house. Um, again, you know, in the past, to the best of my knowledge, you are allowed to bring a firearm. You show up at Customs and Immigration, and only the captain of the vessel is allowed to get off the vessel. Everyone else who is on the boat must stay on the boat. As you approach that port of call, may it be Bimini, West End, wherever it is that you're checking in, as you approach, you must fly a quarantine flag. Okay, as you approach that inlet, indicating that you have not yet checked in with Customs and Immigration. You cannot fish until you check in. The, the line is 13 miles, so once you break that 13 mile barrier of the Bahama Islands, you're in Bahamian waters. You cannot fish until you check in. Once you check in and you clear and you fill out all the paperwork and you pay for your cruising and fishing permit, which keep in mind for boats that are 30 feet or less is $150. For boats that are 30 feet and higher, 35, sorry, I'm always paying the higher side of $300 for boats, three fit, for boats 35 feet or higher, it's $300. You are permitted to use that license again within the same 90 day period. So if you go back a month later or two months later or up to 90 days later, you don't have to pay that same fee again. Okay, keep that in mind. So if you go in May, you know, and obviously you want to go in again in the summertime, you don't have to pay twice. Once you clear customs and immigration, you pull down your quarantine flag and you fly your courtesy flag, your Bohemian courtesy flag. The entire time that you are there, this is flying on your boat from an antenna, an outrigger, whatever it may be, this is flying. This indicates to the Bohemian you know, local authorities that you have in fact checked in. Now just because you are flying this on your boat, does it mean you have checked in? No. Okay. If you get boarded by Bahamas you know, uh, authorities and you don't have all of your paperwork on the boat with you and all you say is, well, we did check in, okay, you potentially are going to have a big old headache. And if you don't check in, you're definitely going to have a headache. So I'm telling you, go out of your way, do the right thing, regardless if you like it or not, 
get to customs and immigration, pay the fee, and check in officially and keep all of the paperwork on the boat with you at all times in the event that you are in fact boarded. I've heard horror stories of people's boats being confiscated because they thought they were, you know, smart, I'll go over there and fish and, oh, I don't need to check in, I'll just fly the flag. Okay, they'll never board me. It'll never happen to me. Well, guess what? It happens, okay? So, once my Bohemian flag is up, you know, I'm safe to fish, I'm ready to go, okay? Now, where am I and what I'm doing? Like I said, it's a, Bah a Bahamas weekend blast. Ideally speaking, this is how I do it and how I would do it and how I recommend you do it. Ideally speaking, you should run over early on a Thursday morning, okay? Early on a Thursday morning. So right now, grab your phones, call your boss, and tell them next week, next Thursday and Friday, you're gonna be sick, okay? Your dog ate your car keys, whatever it is, you're not coming in next Thursday and Friday because you're going to the Bahamas, but don't tell him that. So you cross over early on a Thursday morning. The, cross, the crossing across the Gulf Stream is usually, you know, weather permitting, but usually early in the morning, it's very calm. You know, that wind hasn't kicked up yet. The afternoon breeze, the sea breeze, nice comfortable conditions. You can run over in two to three hours depending on where you're going. Customs doesn't open at the crack of dawn, so don't think you need to run at night to be there at 7 a.m. because that guy hasn't even gotten out of bed yet at 7 a.m. And remember, when you are in the Bahamas, you're on Bahama time. You're not on South Florida time, okay? Bahama time is a whole different animal than South Florida time. I'm gonna tell you that right now, okay? They take everything very slowly there, okay? Seriously, but slowly. So relax, you know? As you cross over, you know, something really magical happens when you're crossing to the Bahamas. You leave Florida, and for the first uh, 18 to 20 miles, you can still see the buildings, the high-rise buildings, Miami, Hollywood, you know, all of these high-rise buildings. You can still see them way out in the distance. And then, of course, they disappear over the horizon. You're just out in the middle of nowhere, what it feels like. You're in the middle of the Gulf Stream. You're in the middle of nowhere. You still have another 25 to 75 miles to go, whatever it is, depending on where you're going. But then as you approach the islands, which, you know, will happen, especially if you're going to Bimini, you're only crossing about 10 or 15 miles of open ocean before you see life on the other side, okay? For that 10 or 15 miles, if you're new at this, don't get alarmed because again, there is something on the other side, I promise you. And then once you see it, you start to get into this state of mind. And as you get closer and closer and closer to the Bahamas, suddenly the water takes on a completely different color. The air takes on a completely different smell. The people slow way down, and everything is completely different, okay? You're in a different world. You're only 50 miles away, but you're a world away, okay? And I'm telling you, it's an amazing feeling that if you've never experienced, you're missing out. It's one of the privileges that we have here in South Florida is having the Bahamas, which is as close to the Caribbean, it's not the Caribbean Sea. Anyone who thinks that the Bahamas is in the Caribbean Sea is mistaken, okay? It's not the Caribbean Sea, it's the Atlantic, but it certainly feels like the Caribbean. The sand is beautiful, the people are awesome, the fishing is completely different than it is here. Like I said, it's literally a world away. So once you get to where you're going, and let's say for the sake of argument, and again, we'll talk more about this later, but if we're going and we're going to be targeting yellowfin tuna, we're going to Grand Bahama Island. And let's say we go to Lukaya, it's 90 miles. We're West End, 70 miles. We're going to get there, we're going to check in with Customs and Immigration. We're then going to go check in at our hotel, wherever we're staying. There's a lot of options nowadays. And West End, of course, you have Old Bahama Bay. You have Blue Marlin Cove a couple miles away, which is a really cool facility. In Lukaya, there's unlimited options. There's a lot of privately owned properties where you can stay now. In Bimini, you've got you know, a ton of options now, ranging from Bimini Sands, really casual. I love that place. You know, you're right there, it's low key. Uh, Resort World Bimini, which 500 bucks a night for a one bedroom. That's up to you if you like that kind of thing, okay? But again, plenty of different options. Get to your room or get to your marina, you know, wherever it is you're staying. Time to unload the boat because you brought a ton of stuff with you, didn't you? You brought a lot of rum, okay, for starters. You got to get that off the boat. You've got food and your clothes and your tackle and all of that good stuff. Plus, you just ran potentially 100 miles. 
you've been up since five o'clock in the morning because, and really you've been up all night because you couldn't sleep because you were so fired up that we're going to the Bahamas tomorrow. You can't sleep. Am I wrong? Right? You can't sleep. You try and sleep, but you can't sleep because you know at the crack of dawn you're going to, to tuna fishing in the Bahamas. So you're exhausted as it is. You run over there. It's a long run. You're dealing with customs. You finally get to your hotel. You unload the boat. You know, by now you're exhausted. You really are. Okay? No, it's not cocktail time yet. All right? <laughs> so you relax for a little while. Remember, it's still Thursday, and I don't need to be home until Sunday because I didn't tell Mike, my boss, that I was going to be back at work till Monday morning. Okay, so I've got all, you know, the, the whole weekend, so to speak. Now, keep in mind, you are fishing an area that you're not familiar with. I don't care how familiar you think you are with it. You haven't been there in weeks, months, the whole season. In other words, you don't have your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Okay, you don't know where those fish are, where they're not. You don't know exactly what the conditions are like. You may have read reports, you may have talked to buddies, but until you're really there immersed in it, until you're surrounded in it and you feel it, you don't know it, okay? You're only guessing. So what we like to do on that first day is kind of get a feel for the lay of the land, so to speak. You know, we're in no rush. We're just trying to figure things out. We got there, we got all set up. If it's still early enough in the middle of the day, which usually isn't the case because we've relaxed for a while, maybe had a couple pina coladas, jumped in the pool, whatever. We're now unwinding and really now we're on Bahama time. Okay? And in order to successfully catch fish in the Bahamas, you have to be on Bahama time. Okay? So remember that. Don't go there all stressed, fast, high paced because it's not going to work for you. And you, you'll see why before all of this is over. You know, in order to be successful, especially with the yellowfin tuna, you need restraint and you need patience. Okay? And trust me, that's not easy when you're all hyped up after running 100 miles over to the islands. So here it is on that Thursday and we decide that we want to start looking for the tunas. Now I'm going to pause for one second and I'm going to back up and we're going to talk a little bit more about the locations, about where am I going and why. Bimini, as I mentioned, the closest, easiest to get to, very easy, in and out, convenient, comfortable, some really good bottom fishing, deep drop fishing, 10 miles north of Bimini. Okay, great spot for the people who have never been to the islands, great place to start. If you've been there and you're experienced or you really want to catch the tunas, as I mentioned, Grand Bahama Island. Go all the way, baby. If you're going, go all the way. Okay, go. Do it. Spend the extra time and money. It's going to make a big difference. Why? Because of the lay of the land. Look at a chart. Look at Google Maps, the satellite image, okay? Just to get an idea. You will see that the lay of the land, the way that the, the structure is formed around the Bohemian Islands, supports a very, very healthy, deep water, pelagic fishery closer to Grand Bahama Island in the Northwest Providence Channel than it does around Bimini. So even if you're going to Bimini to go tuna fishing, you're not tuna fishing in Bimini. You're going up into the channel. Okay, you're going, there's a giant ocean, well, it's called the channel, but it's really a giant ocean that separates Bimini and Grand Bahama Island. 30, 40 miles wide, depending on where you are, okay? That's where there are deep, deep water canyons, okay? That Northwest Providence Channel is fed from the east, from the wide open Atlantic Ocean, and it dumps out on the west into the Gulf Stream, okay? That area has a, a series of really, really deep canyons. You, it's clear as day, it's unmistakable. And what do those canyons do? They hold a ton of bait fish, they hold, they, they produce a lot of upwellings and currents and in turn that pushes all of that nutrient rich water up toward the surface and in turn you can follow the food chain from there. And it provides prime habitat for yellowfin tuna. Prime habitat, that's what they love. That's where the feeding grounds are. Are you potentially going to catch a yellowfin tuna right out front of Bimini? Absolutely. Anything's possible. You can catch a yellowfin tuna right here right now. Okay, it's possible. But if you were specifically targeting them, wouldn't you want to go where they live? Wouldn't you want to go where their major food sources are? Okay, because again, that's what you're after. So even if you're staying in Bimini, you're still going to go up and fish the channel for the tuna. So sometimes it's easier, often if not always, to stay on Grand Bahama Island 
because again, you're going to have better deep drop fishing and you're going to have closer access to those deep water canyons. Now keep in mind, there's a series of canyons. There's one strip of canyon, really, really deep water, unmistakable, that is approximately five miles off the beach. It's that close, five miles south of Grand Bahama Island. Okay, just below Lucaya, Freeport, and it stretches all the way to West End. The tip of that canyon stretches to West End, and just the way that it lies, kind of southeast to northwest, okay, it kind of pushes off West End a little bit, and it's about 10 miles off of West End, just again because of the shape of the land. But off of Freeport and Lucaya, that canyon is only about five miles. Then there's about a 15 mile plateau stretch where it's relatively flat. Then there's the big canyons where they drop off tremendously again, and they're about 20 miles south of Grand Bahama Island of Lucaya and Freeport. And if you were running there from West End, say Blue Marlin Cove, it's about a 30 mile run, okay? If you're running to those areas from Bimini, it's a minimum of 30 miles before you can even look for fish. It's a minimum of 30 miles. So either way, you're running there. So like I said, if the option exists, I would certainly recommend going to Grand Bahama. If you're gonna go to Grand Bahama, you've gotta make a decision. Do I go to West End, all the way on the westernmost point of Grand Bahama? Beautiful resort there called, called Old Bahama Bay. Absolutely gorgeous, best conch fritters in all of the Bahamas. Okay, great, but not a lot of nightlife, not a lot of any life, really. You're, you're there at Old Bahama Bay and you're enjoying Old Bahama Bay and that's all that you're doing. You're at Old Bahama Bay. It's costly as well. A little bit down from there is Blue Marlin Cove, there's Boodle Bay, a little bit lower key. Then of course you can continue to go east to Lucaya. Lucaya has a vibrant nightlife. Casinos, nightclubs, shopping, restaurants. Trust me, there's something for everyone in Lucaya. So depending on what your crowd is like, in other words, who's on the boat with you and what your goals are, because really, you're going to the Bahamas, right? And not everybody wants to fish from dawn to dusk. And it's nice to have some other activities to do when you get back or in between. You know, you might as well enjoy it all. So Lucaya, Lucaya, as I mentioned, is wide open with a lot more options. A lot more options for lodging, for nightlife, for restaurants, things to that nature, okay? So here it is that Thursday, we decide, hey, you know, we've relaxed for a while. It's our first day here. Let's go kind of get a feel for what's going on out there. You know, we're at Lucaya, we're wherever, West End again, none of it makes a difference. It's all the same. The first thing we're gonna do is decide, we're gonna look for those tunas, and we're not gonna start to even think about yellowfin tuna until at least three or four in the afternoon, okay? At least three or four in the afternoon. Could you catch yellowfin tuna in the middle of the day? Absolutely, you certainly can. Can you catch yellowfin tuna at dawn in low light conditions? Absolutely, you certainly can. That's a prime time dawn. But in order for me to be on my boat looking for yellowfin tuna where they live in those canyons at 7 a.m., I need to be up at 5 a.m. And I'm in the Bahamas. What did I say to you? I'm on Bahama time, right? Okay, and I don't want to run in the dark. I'm unfamiliar with that area. I don't need to. I don't need to get up that early and do that kind of thing because once that bite, that bite's going to dissipate. From the minute I get there at 7 o'clock, it's going to start to dissipate at 7 a.m. By 9 a.m., 10 a.m., when that sun is really high in the sky, that bite's over. Why? Because tuna have this big, amazing eye, an amazing eyesight, okay? And they don't like bright light. They're affected by bright light. They like that darker, low-light conditions. So the higher the sun gets, the lower in the water column those fish are going to go. They're going to go deeper in the water column. And it's hard to target yellowfin tuna that are 800 feet below the surface. Okay? And, be and believe me, they will swim 800 feet below the surface, if not even more, to look for food or just to look for cooler water, more comfortable conditions, and not so bright. So in the afternoon, as the day starts to slowly cool down, okay, slowly, and it's not cooling a lot, but it's slowly starting to cool down, those fish will move up. They'll move up in the water column, and as afternoon turns into evening, they really start to, to feed and really start to look for prey 
and really start to become very active. So your key time to find and catch those yellowfin tuna is always going to be, gosh, if I have to narrow it down, 5 to 8 p.m. is that magic hour period. Sometimes even 6 to 8. Other guys here will, will confirm with me that sometimes that bite doesn't turn on until 8 p.m. and you only have an hour to catch them. Okay, because it'll only turn on right there when it's just getting dark. Okay, so keep in mind it's a low light condition type of fishery. Now, regardless of where you're staying and where you're fishing, the number one most important factor that you are looking for when you are tuna fishing, by show of hands, what is the number one most important factor that you're looking for? Birds. 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 Let me say it again. Birds. Let me say it one more time. Birds. 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 I don't care how you say it, okay? Birds are a giant red flag. It's a big ocean out there. It's very, very deep. You've got miles and miles and miles, and you can't be everywhere all of the time, okay? You can't. You, your boat can only be in one spot. Certainly, of course, you can move around, but you can't be everywhere all of the time. So you have to look for the birds. Now, understand that yellowfin tuna are in the Northwest Providence Channel year round. Year round, you can catch those fish every single day of the year. They're certainly more predominant now in May, June, and July, and certainly May and June, but you can catch them any day of the year. Just ask the locals, they'll tell you that they know because a lot of them do that, okay? However, it is far easier to catch them now because of the birds, because what happens in the fall, the birds migrate and the birds are gone. So it's hard to find the fish because the birds aren't there, okay? In the spring, the birds migrate back. And by April, certainly by May, the birds are in full force. And sometimes, we're, when I say birds, I'm not talking about two little tuna chicks flying around, okay? I'm talking about birds, a flock of so many birds that the sky is black, okay? I, I kid you not. That's what a feeding frenzy in the Bahamas is all about when you see those birds like that. Okay, the fish drive the bait toward the surface, and it doesn't have to be a lot of fish. Visualize this. Don't think that every time you see a flock of birds, there's 500 tunas under those birds. Absolutely not. There may be. You hope that there is, but absolutely not. There could be a small hunting pack of three to five tunas, three to five, and they're scrambling around, they're, they're, they're pushing bait up toward the surface, Birds start to get on it and it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. Okay, as the night progresses, as the evening progresses, those bait pods start to get balled up, the fish get balled up, and the birds get balled up, and the activity just blows up. Okay, and it gets more and more exciting as the night go as the evening goes on. You know, ideally you want to get out there, you want to catch them, you want to run back and get to your marina before it gets dark. Right? That's like the perfect scenario. But don't be afraid to push it. Don't be afraid to stay out there on the grounds and keep fishing until it's pitch black and then run back, you know? So keep that in mind. The birds, I can't stress this enough. You can only see birds with your naked eye for so far, okay? And let me tell you something. Sometimes, you know, clearly I wear glasses. I'm running a boat there. My buddy's like, Mike, the birds, the birds. And I'm like, where? I don't see any birds, and there's a whole flock right there that I didn't see because they were like right on that edge of visibility. So it's super important that at the very least, very least, you better have a good quality pair of binoculars, at the very least. And if you have radar, even better. Okay, we all know this, that these guys that go over to the Bahamas that are the most successful at catching yellowfin tuna have powerful radars on their boat that are tuned in to find birds from miles away. Okay, not that you're gonna find, you know, don't get sucked into a 72 mile radar. Okay, don't think that you have a 72 mile super fancy dancy radar and suddenly you're gonna see birds at 46 miles away and know exactly where to go. That's not gonna happen, people. Okay, best case scenario, I keep my radar split screen. Sometimes it's six miles, three miles, or three miles, two miles, you know. You're looking within your reach, within your vicinity. Okay, because really powerful radar systems that are tuned in. And of course, 
A lot of variables here. If you're in a sport fish boat and your radar is higher up and you have a 25 kilowatt radar with an eight foot open array, okay, that's shooting a laser beam across the sky, you're obviously gonna see a lot more birds than the guy in the 21 foot center console with a little ray dome on the top of his hard top. It's obvious, okay? But across the board, six kilowatts, you know, is usually what these center console boats are running and we can see birds depending on the density of the flock and the activity of the flock three to six miles away we can pick up birds okay again depending on the density and the activity of the flock so just because you have found the birds doesn't mean you're going to catch fish okay and anybody can attest to that just because you found the birds doesn't mean you're going to catch fish because this is where everything comes into play so remember what I said, we left, it's Thursday afternoon, we did our thing in the pool, we're relaxed, we're chilled, we're going tuna fishing, you know. Now, did we bring live bait or do we not have live bait? That's another really important subject. A lot of these super center consoles, these high performance boats, including my CV370, we've got multiple bait wells that are capable of holding hundreds if not thousands of live baits. Do you need to run to the Bahamas with a thousand live pilchards to catch tunas? No. How many people here would be happy going to the Bahamas and coming home with five yellowfin tuna? Okay. Whoever's not raising their hand is lying. We all would love to go to the Bahamas and come home with five yellowfin tuna. We'd all love it more to go to the Bahamas and come home with 18 yellowfin tuna, wouldn't we? Okay. Of course we would, but we certainly wouldn't be disappointed with five. So the live bait gig absolutely is a benefit. There's no question. Listen, what fishery does live bait and live chumming not outdo dead chunking? You know what I'm saying? You're talking live pilchards thrown into a mealie of, uh, of a feeding frenzy. Of course you're going to get bit. Of course you're going to have more success. But is it mandatory? No. Understand that when those tuna fish are balled up and schooled up and pushing that bait up toward the surface, okay? They're moving, they're moving fast. That bait is not just sitting in one spot. And I know we all watch National Geographic Discovery Channel and you see these big bait balls and they appear to just be sitting in one spot. And all the fish are moving in from all the angles and eating it and it's like that bait ball's in the same spot forever. That's the magic of TV, okay? That bait ball's moving. All of the forage is moving. It's being chased by 50 pound yellowfin tuna. You think I'm gonna sit there? I'm trying to move as fast as I possibly can. So the activity, everything that's happening is happening so fast. You know, it really, really is. So you have to look at that. And you have to understand that these tuna fish are balling this bait up. They're moving it up toward the surface. The bait's being attacked from below from the tuna and it's being attacked from above from the birds. Talk about being a, having a bad day, right? You're getting it from both sides. So in turn, they're moving. There's a lot of stuff happening. So if you have live bait and you're standing in the back of the boat and you're throwing netfuls of live pilchards versus the next guy who's throwing a couple of cut chunks every couple minutes, a couple of cut chunks, which guy is more likely going to pique the tuna's interest? The cut bait. <laughs> Winner! Okay. Obviously, the live bait, okay? But keep in mind, again, that those fish are moving, and depending on how many fish are there, depending on what's going on, the live bait doesn't guarantee you success, but it certainly leans the odds in your favor. Understand that those pods and those birds, like I said, are moving fast. When you approach that on that first night even, we're really anxious, we want to get out there, we want to you know, bend a rod, we want to catch some fish, and we're, we run to that first series of canyons, we're constantly looking for birds, we don't see anything, we decide, you know, forget this spot, let's go all the way, and run to the 20 mile canyons, and we're looking around and we finally see a patch of birds that really looks good. Most people are just super anxious, would run right up to it full speed, drop their baits, and catch nothing. Okay, because A, you will likely put the fish down, okay, because the elephant tuna are, are not stupid, 
okay? They're not stupid. And you get one boat that runs across a pot of fish, maybe not a big deal. You get three or four boats crisscrossing over a pot of feeding fish, what's gonna happen to those fish? They're gone, they're gonna sound. They're going straight down. Maybe not the stupid black fins, okay? But the smart yellow fins are going straight down, okay? You've got to approach that pot of birds, and this is going to apply through your entire weekend trip. You have to uh, stop. Stop. The birds aren't going anywhere. The fish are right there. They're feeding. The birds are going crazy. You're a quarter mile away, 500 yards away, 200 yards away, whatever. You're keeping a safe and clear distance. Stop, okay, and do nothing for, just stop for a second. And this is the hardest thing that people can do. And pay attention. Look at the birds. Are they going this way? Are they going that way? Which way is the school moving? Okay, and I promise you, it will be moving. Which way is all of this activity moving? Is it going to the east? Is it going to the west? Which way is it moving? Try and evaluate that right out of the gate. Number two, okay, who's doing what? You get four guys on a boat who are all fired up to go catch tunas, and you get on a pot of fish, and everybody's just grabbing a rod, grabbing a bait, dropping a bait down. Who's throwing the chum? Who's throwing the chunks? Who's gaffing? Okay, who's doing what? Figure that out. Get that dialed in, okay? Because I'm telling you, you may not get another shot, and you have to take advantage of every shot that you can. So you've got to work together as a team. What if the guy who's throwing the chunks or the live pilchards, whichever it is, what if he has a rod in his hand and he hooks up? And now he's fighting a 50 to 70 pound yellowfin. Who's taking his duty on the, you know, throwing the chunks or throwing the live baits? Because if you don't keep that flow going, they're gone. Those fish are gone. You're in the middle of fighting a fish. You're not chasing a flock of birds, okay? You're, you're hooked up to two, maybe three, maybe one, whatever it is. So you've got to do whatever you can to keep those fish around so you can turn one hooked fish into two hooked fish and potentially three hooked fish. You know, anybody that's been over to the islands enough time tuna fishing knows that you catch your fish in clusters. You know, in other words, it's rarely one here, one there, one here, it's, oh, we just got two or three, and that blast, you know, then, oh, we didn't get any, oh, we just got two. You, you know, it's usually like clusters, like blasts like that. So make sure that you've got a plan in place and everybody knows what their role is on the boat and that everybody can back everybody else up. Get your tackle ready, okay? Who's fishing what rod? Get the rods ready, double check the drags. You gotta move fast and efficiently, but you gotta work together like a machine. Okay, and make sure that all of that is dialed in before you run up on those birds. Now we're ready to go. We're ready to go. I know I'm fishing this rod, he's fishing this rod, et cetera, et cetera. We're ready to go. We know the birds are moving east. So we're gonna set up in front of the birds. Okay, we don't wanna go right to the birds because we don't wanna put the fish down. We wanna set up our drift. We wanna predict where they're going to be. Not where they are, because I know where they are. I'm looking right at them. Fight the temptation to run your boat into the middle of the school because by the time you get to the middle of the school and you start feeding your baits out, whoop, they're already gone. The trick is to have your baits in the strike zone as they come across. Does that make sense? Everybody kind of following me there? That's the trick. And you set up in front of those birds and you start chunking. Okay, start chunking or live chumming, whichever it is. Okay, if you have live baits, great. Start throwing them. You don't have to throw a thousand at a time, three or four, three or four, three or four, you know what I mean? Just a nice steady flow of live pilchards. If you don't have live pilchards, don't think you're out of the game. Like I said, you can chunk. You can be very successful catching yellowfin tunas with no live bait at all, just fish and chunks. How much chunks? How many chunks? You know, think about this. You've got a school of hungry yellowfin tuna that are chasing a big ball of bait, whatever that bait is, and you're throwing three pieces of cut ballyhoo, and then you're waiting three minutes and you're throwing three more pieces of cut ballyhoo, and then you're waiting three minutes and you're throwing the head that was laying on the corner of the cutting table, okay? And then three more pieces. Are you going to, you might as well not even be chunking. Honestly, you might as well not even be chunking because what you're doing is not doing anything. It really isn't. I remember one trip, south of Grand Bahama Island, 
We had gotten to a pod of tuna that were so thick, I've never seen anything like it in my life. My entire screen, my entire Furuno screen, from the surface down to 200 feet was completely covered in fish. We were chunking with five gallon buckets. We were dumping five gallon buckets of chunks. It was our last night there. We had three five gallon buckets. We said, ah, to hell with it, and just started dumping the entire buckets, you know, just to try and keep those fish around us. Fortunately, it worked. So the more you can chunk, the better. That's what it boils down to. The more that you can chunk, the better. You may even catch fish by not chunking at all. But of course, chunking is certainly going to help you. You don't want to chum. And when I say chum, ground menhaden chum that you eat fish for yellowtail with, you don't want to chum. Why? Sharks. sharks. Okay, there's a big problem in the Bahamas, sharks. And guess what their number one favorite, favorite thing to eat is? Tuna. Tuna. Especially yellowfin tuna. Okay? Don't ask me why, but they know. They know that yellowfin tuna tastes so good. And they will do everything that they can do to eat your yellowfin tuna. So, that's right. So, in turn, you don't want to attract the, char the sharks to the boat. Another benefit to the live chumming, right? Another benefit to throwing live bait is it's not as oily and sticky and messy and juicy as cutting up fresh chunks, which is more likely going to attract sharks into the mix as well. But the chunks are better than nothing. So once you set up in front of those birds, you have an option. How do I fish? How do I catch these yellowfin tuna? Okay, how do I tempt one of these fish to eat? Now understand what you are primarily looking at. With all of those birds and all of that action up on the surface, the vast majority of what you're seeing is not being created by yellowfins most of the time. Most of the time it's being created by blackfin tuna. Okay, and some of the blackfin tuna in the Bahamas can be very, very large. We're talking fish in excess of 30, 35, 40 pounds. Big, big blackfin tuna. There's a lot of schoolies, a lot of footballs, a lot of 15 to 20 pound fish, which are a ton of fun to catch too. So, if you have somebody that doesn't specifically want to target the yellow fins or wants to have some fun, make sure that you bring a lighter jigging outfit. This is not for the yellow fins. I'm making this clear. This is for the black fin tuna. It's a lighter jigging outfit, okay? Loaded with 30 pound braid with a 50 pound top shot on top of the braid. A lot of fun, really light, really comfortable, vertical jig, drop it down, catch blackfin tuna after blackfin tuna till your arms fall off. Not the target species, but I'll tell you what, it feels good going back to the dock or coming home with 18 blackfin tuna in the boat or whatever, than no tuna in the boat. Because the, the yellow fins are not always a guarantee, the black fins are almost always a guarantee. And they're, they're really a close second. So make sure that you have a jigging rod ready to go for the black fins. But back to the yellow fins. So the yellow fin tuna are generally, not generally, always <coughs> under the smaller black fins, they're under the smaller juvenile yellow fins. Those bigger ones, like I said, are not dumb. And when I say bigger, any yellow fin tuna that you hook in the Bahamas could be 20 pounds or 120 pounds or anywhere in between 20 to 120 now ironically well I don't want to say ironically but dolphin fishing do you ever see a two pound dolphin and a 22 pound dolphin side by side no why because the 20 pound dolphin will eat the two pound dolphin well, yellowfin tuna, that's not the case. While yellowfin tuna, especially big cows, will eat smaller black fins and bonitas and stuff, generally they'll mix in size. It's not uncommon to have mixed size fish in the same pod. So you don't know if your next bait is going to catch your hook that 20 pounder or 120 pounder. So you have to be ready for the 120 pounder, okay? And understand that while you can catch 120 pound yellowfin tuna on a lightweight jigging outfit with 30 pound braid all day long if you have three hours, okay, what's going to happen if that fish is hooked and you're fighting them for an extended period of time? Two things are happening. What is the first? Sharked. It's almost a guarantee that you put a struggling tuna in the water that's potentially bleeding from its gills, and he's in his spirals and his pinwheels doing circles for three hours, he's gonna get eaten by a shark. So you don't have the time 
to fight those fish on ultralight tackle or on light tackle. Plus, the flock is gone because you're still sitting there fighting this one fish on light tackle and that whole flock is now two miles away and you've got to relocate them again and start the whole process over again. So you've got to beef it up and fish some heavier gear. Now there's a lot of different options. One option is a typical conventional outfit, a trolling rod. Not everybody has different sets of rods that they could use for trolling or they can use for fishing bait. But fortunately in the Bahamas, a trolling rod, a 50 pound clash trolling rod, is a great versatile rod that you can do a lot with. I can troll with this, and we're gonna talk about trolling too for the tunas, or I certainly can fish bait with this, okay? It's a bent butt rod because I want that extra leverage. These are super powerful fish, super powerful, okay? They're very, very strong. They, they will fight till the very end. You ever see a yellowfin tuna come up on the surface, you throw him on the boat and he just lays there and goes, okay, you got me, I'm dead. No, they're flipping out, they're going crazy, okay? Because they're not done fighting yet. You're done, they're not done, okay? They, they will fight till the end. They never give up. The only time they'll give up is when you sink that gaff in their face or when a shark eats it or when it busts a line, okay? They are extremely powerful. So you need something that's capable of handling these powerful fish. In this particular case, again, typical you know, stand-up rod. This one has Stewart roller guides. It's rated for 50 to 100 pound line. You don't have to have roller guides. You can fish ring guides. Obviously a chaos rod. Don't fish any other rod other than a chaos rod or you're not gonna catch anything. Just a side note, but putting that aside. You don't have to have rollers. It could be ring guides. A good quality conventional reel. This is a Maxell. 30 wide, we just started using these. I'm actually pretty impressed with them. They're affordable, nice two-speed reel. You want that low gear, why? Think about how a tuna fights. Think about how a 100-pound yellowfin tuna fights. He's gonna eat that bait, he's gonna do a screaming run, you're gonna lock it up, the circle hook or the J-hook's, you know, circle hook's gonna get him in the corner of the mouth nine out of 10 times, the J-hook's gonna get him right in the throat, hopefully in the belly, because I wanna hurt him but putting that aside, okay? He's gonna do a screaming run, then eventually he's gonna calm down and start to do a big circle pattern. Big spirals like this. And he's gonna lay on his side and he's gonna keep his head pointed down. And the trick to beating that fish is to take that angle with that fish's head pointed down and simply bring his head up, okay? He can be on the same spiral. You're not gonna stop him from doing that. You're not gonna say, yellowfin swim straight toward me. He's not going to do it. He's going to spiral. But if you can keep his head up toward the surface, you are going to win that fight much faster and you're going to be much more successful in the long run. How do you do that? You do that with short pumps. Short pumps, not, uh, uh, not long pumps, short. Even if you lift that rod tip six inches and get one crank, six inches, one crank, just short, short pumps. A good way to do that, especially for younger anglers, older anglers, women, because anybody can catch yellowfin tuna. It's not about brute strength. It's about endurance and it's about technique and it's about having the proper tackle that fits you correctly, okay? And that makes a big difference. This is not a universal rod that works for everybody in this room. Everybody in this room could fish this rod, but you know what, if you're a little bit taller, you may want a longer butt. If you're shorter, you may, you know, there's so many different variations and that's the nice thing about building a custom rod, seriously, is that you could build it specifically for your body size so you could be as effective as possible. But make sure that the tackle that you choose to fish fits you, works well with you. When you are fighting that fish, it's always a good idea to, at the bare minimum, have a fighting belt or even a, this is what's called a kidney harness. It's a kidney harness, okay? It goes right around your waist. You've got a big fighting belt. This dissipates all of that pressure across both of your front hips. I can put this on, put the rod right in there. I can snap the reel right into the kidney harness and I could let go completely. And the rod is right in the rod holder, fastened to me, okay? And I can let go. Completely. I could lean back, I could rest, and, but remember, you rest, who else is resting? He's resting. And every time he goes, <sighs> he's resting, he's oxygenating his blood, and that fight's going to go on even longer. So the longer you rest, the longer he rests. Just remember that. But nevertheless, 
have the proper equipment. But when you hook that 100 pound fish, is no time to say, okay, put that harness on me. No, wait, strap that tighter. No, wait, it's slipping off. Make that tighter. In other words, this has to be fit for you in advance of that battle. There are certainly products that are adjustable with Velcro, Velcro straps, things to that nature. But these little snaps here that go from the kidney harness you know, to the reel are adjustable as well, but it all depends on what rod you're fishing and what size your body is. So make sure you make all of these adjustments in advance. And don't be a tough guy and think, no, I don't need a belt. Okay, I don't need a belt. Okay, no, I need a belt. Give me a belt. Okay, the fish is 100 pounds. Give me a belt. I want to get them in the boat. I don't want to kill myself. I want to catch another one and move on. Okay, that's why they created these things. Anybody ever hear of AFCO? Okay. I mean, come on, that, that's what they're out there for, use them. So in turn, one option, as I mentioned, is a conventional outfit. Good conventional reel, in my particular case, loaded with 50 pound braid, okay? 750 yards of 50 pound braid. There's no yellow, if that yellowfin tuna spools me, he deserves to live. <laughs> Just saying, he deserves to live. If he takes 750 yards of line without me being able to stop him, Good for you, okay? Live on. This is all you need. You don't want to go tackle that's too big. You don't want to go with an 80 wide, you know, or these 130s giant marlin reels. That's too much, that's overkill. Now you're fighting the tackle instead of fighting the fish and enjoying the battle. So you need tackle that's light, but certainly capable of getting the job done. I never fish my braid, regardless if I'm trolling or if I'm fishing a live bait or a chunk bait. I'm never going to fish my braid right to the hook because two and a half phenomenal eyesight. We talked about this earlier. So I want stealth. I want strength, but I want stealth. So on top of my braid, I have a hundred foot top shot of 80 pound fluorocarbon leader. Diamond presentation fluorocarbon leader. Nearly invisible in the water, super abrasion resistant, and I start with 80. There are times when these fish are very finicky and you're gonna have to go from 80 and say, I need to scale down to 60. And then you may even have to scale down to 50. Anything less than that and you're asking for trouble with the tunas, with the yellow fins. You certainly can bag the black fins, but you're gonna have problems with the yellow fins. So I start with 80 but always be ready to scale down, okay? Always be ready to scale down. One really cool technique, can you hold that for me? You're my rod holder, Perfect. okay? You're my rod holder. So on my conventional outfit, we're approaching that flock of birds. Here they are, we've set up, we're chunking. Man, I'm excited. My heart's just pumping like crazy because I know that I could hook a really nice fish here. So on the end of my rig, and clearly this has a little bit of double line and it goes to a snap swivel because I'm using this for trolling as well. But in this particular scenario, on the end of this right here is a hook, a live bait hook or a circle hook. Uh, VMC Tuna Tamer 7.0 is a perfect tuna hook. You know, make sure though that if you're gonna use, for example, a circle hook or any, any sort of live bait hook, that it's a short, stubby, strong hook. Not one of these, you know, a lot of times we talk about and I encourage people to use the thin wire circle hooks, like when you're deep dropping, they penetrate the fish very easily. That is not the case with big yellowfin tuna. You need a sturdy hook. You're putting a lot of heat on these things because again, you're trying to get them in the boat as quickly as possible before they get sharked and you pay your taxes, as we so say. So on the end of this, I've got a hook, 7-0 hook. I've got it buried in, let's say I don't have live bait, a whole squid, frozen squid, okay? I've got the hook buried in it because I'm trying to hide that hook because again, they have phenomenal eyesight. I've got a six to eight foot leader, six to eight feet, no more than that, and I'll explain why in a second. And then I have a fish finder rig tip, basically. In other words, a barrel swivel with an egg sinker. Barrel swivel with an egg sinker. Why? Because I want my bait to go below all of those blackfin tunas. All of the blackfin tuna are focused in on really small baits, okay, really small baits. You'll see it, you'll catch them, gaff them, throw them in the boat and they're spitting up these little like minnows, silver sides, whatever this juvenile little bait is. They're not focused on eating a squid this big. However, a 100 pound yellowfin, he's focused on eating that squid. 
He don't, he don't care about that little half inch bait. He weighs 72 pounds. That little bait like that, he'd need to eat 10,000 of those to get a meal. So he's really looking for that bigger bait. So the bigger bait with an egg sinker, what we do is the rod stays in the rod holder, clickers on, and just feed it out like this. Nice and steady, feed it out. Leave the rod right in the rod holder. It's not going anywhere. Just feed it out, okay, at the same pace that your chunks are flowing because you really want it to look as natural as possible. How big of a lead? Four to eight ounces. You know, you can mix it up a little bit. Have one guy fish a four ounce lead. Have one guy try an eight ounce lead. If a pattern develops, be ready to adapt. Okay, because remember everything we're talking about, listen, this isn't, you know, it's not a, it's a science, but it's not a science because we can't predict how the fish are going to act on any given day. All we can do is put a system in place, go after those fish with tactics and techniques that we know are effective. But we don't know how they're gonna react to that on any given day based on any number of conditions. So we have to be ready to adapt. We have to be ready to, to scale down our leader material. We have to be ready to maybe use a smaller hook even, still as strong, but smaller because they're being line shy. We have to be ready to put on heavier sinkers if we need to, you know, again, Half the battle is preparation. The more prepared you are, the more ready you are to adapt to any situation that you're gonna encounter. So you simply feed the bait out, get it down there as the boat is drifting. And if you play your cards right, and if luck is on your side, fish will come by, line will start screaming off the reel, game over from there. I think you all know what happens from there. If it doesn't happen, you can go ahead and reel that up. Thank you. Great job for our rod holder here, okay? If that doesn't happen, okay, keep the rod. yeah, yeah, keep the rod, <laughs> right. You know what, no, give me the rod, take one of those trucks out there, all right? The guy that bought you dinner, he'll hand you the keys too, all right, take that. In turn, if you don't hook up on that pot of fish when those birds came by, you got to do it all over again. You got to start all over again and say, okay, let's regroup. Stop chunking, let's figure out what the birds are, where are they, we need to find them again, and we need to regroup and go do it again. And you go boom, 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 and you do this over and over and over as many times as you possibly can. Sometimes you're gonna do it, you're gonna get the boat set up, you're gonna start chunking, you're gonna get your baits in the water, and the birds are coming at you, and at the last minute they go whoop, and they go completely a different direction. That ever happen to anybody? Okay. And they right, it's like they see you and go, oh, there's Mike. Nah, forget it. We're going this way. Okay? And they go a completely different way. So you just wasted all that time and effort. On the other hand, sometimes you hit pay dirt and it works out perfectly. So there's no way, again, to predict that. That's also another reason that, you know, the most effective boat, in my opinion, for yellowfin tuna fishing in the Bahamas when you're chasing birds is a really fast center console because you can get around fast, you can move around fast. It has a small profile as compared to a custom 70 something foot Merit, which would be nice, a custom 70 foot Merit, but it's just a different animal than a fast high performance center console, okay? You know, you're, like I said, you're able to maneuver from school to school. Some guys will shut their motors down just to keep it as stealthy and quiet as possible when those fish are coming by to achieve as natural of a you know, presentation as they possibly can. Other guys don't think so much about that. You know, I mean, the fish are in a frenzy. They're feeding on bait. Do I really need to shut my motors down? I never do. And only because, you know, really today's outboard engines, you know, my Mercury Verados are so quiet, I don't even know when they're running. You know, it's not like yesteryear's two strokes that are, blah, 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 you know, and you got all the smoke and blah. Today's engines, you don't even know when they're running. Literally, when they're at idle, I've got to look down at the gauges to see if they're running or not. They're that quiet. So you tend to forget that the engines are making any noise whatsoever, okay? Um, and then, like I said, you've got to go from pod to pod to pod to pod. The more chunks that you have, the better. If you have live bait, certainly throw it. Okay. Every time you hook a fish, of course you're going to try and hook multiple fish out of that same pod, but focus on getting that fish in the boat. Because remember, you're not going there to try and catch 50 tunas. Anybody know what the law is in the Bahamas? How many yellowfin tuna can I keep? Eight, 18 total. Okay. There are conflicting reports on the internet. Do not believe everything you see on the internet. 
And I'm telling you that there are conflicting reports. One report says you are allowed six yellowfin tuna per person. So if I go over to the Bahamas and if I have five people on my boat, according to that report, I am entitled to kill 30 yellowfin tuna. I then get boarded by Bahamas Customs and they now confiscate my 37 foot CV and lock me up in jail where my food comes on the same bucket that I have to go to the bathroom in. That's the Bahamas. Okay? It is not six per person. It is 18 pelagic species per vessel at any one time. So you are never allowed to be in possession of more than 18 yellowfin tuna at any one time. So the most that you can catch, sorry, the most that you can keep at any one time is 18. Now that does not mean I can keep eight. Question? Is there a weight limit at all? No. His question, is there a weight limit? Excellent question. Is there a weight limit on yellowfin tuna? No. But there is, as I mentioned, 18. Okay. So in turn, that doesn't mean I can fish today, kill 18, go back to the marina, go tomorrow and kill 18 more, go back to the marina, go the third day, kill 18 more, and then come back to Florida with 54 yellowfin tuna. Okay. That's right. You know, you just can't do it. You can never be in possession of more than 18. So also be careful because you catch 15 blackfin tuna that you've already caught, and then you get on a hot yellowfin bite, and you catch three. You may be done. I take that small blackfin over the side. I don't know about you. I'm not done. I'm just saying. That's chunk baits, all right? That's immediate chunk baits, okay? So just, and, and this also applies, you know, we're going to talk about deep dropping, but be careful because the numbers almost play the same way when you're deep dropping for queen snappers. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So again, 18 pelagics, yes? When you come back here, we've heard a lot of different things. The rules apply to there if you have proof that you've been there, or do you have to? His question is, and, you know, I'm going to try not to answer any more questions till the end of the seminar only because I have a lot more to talk about, and I'll address all of the questions at the end of the seminar. But he had an excellent question. He said, you know, I'm fishing in the Bahamas. I'm coming back to Florida, okay? What's the rule? The rule is you always have to follow the stricter of the two, which is always going to be Florida for the most part. So you cannot, for example, if you... I'm trying to think of a good example, you know, lo well, lobster, yeah, but groupers. If, the, if you can kill grouper in the Bahamas, but grouper season is closed in Florida, you're not bringing grouper legally back to Florida, okay? You have to follow Florida regulations. If you fillet fish in the Bahamas and you bring it back, it has to have the skin intact so they can identify what fish, what species that fillet came from. And they, of course, equate two fillets to every one fish. So always follow the Florida law. If it's closed in Florida, don't bring it back to Florida. That's the bottom line. If the limit in Florida is 10 snapper per person and you went over there by yourself and you caught 20 queen snapper, you are not entitled to come back to Florida by yourself with 20 queen snapper because you're breaking state law, okay, and South Atlantic fisheries law. So it's always Florida that you should keep in, the, you know, in your mind. Also keep in mind you cannot fish on the way to the Bahamas. You cannot show up in the Bahamas with fish in your boat. You're also not supposed to fish on your way home from the Bahamas. <laughs> I'm 45 miles off the beach. I come across a pallet. It's covered up in gaffer fins. I'm not, not telling you what to do, okay? Uh, you do whatever you want to do, okay? I wasn't coming home. I wasn't. After we caught him, I decided we should go home, okay? But I wasn't coming home at that time. So again, it's sticky. Listen, I'm not telling you to break the law, obviously. And not that every time all of this is going to happen, but pay attention. Be a law-abiding fisherman, you know? You got to do the right thing and know the law. Do your homework before you go, you know? Do your homework before you go. Okay, so we went out that first night, you know, we're back to our Thursday night here, and we talked about what happens if we find those birds, but you know what happened on this particular occasion? We never saw a single bird, never. 
we looked and looked and looked and searched and searched and looked and searched and looked and never saw a single bird. Okay? But we got a feel for the conditions. We know that those birds weren't there tonight on this Thursday night. We go back, we run back, we relax. It's our first night there. Cocktails may be flowing, whatever. We eat, we relax, we get up the next morning and we decide now before we go tuna fishing this afternoon and this evening, we want to go deep dropping. Okay, we want to go catch some queen snapper. There are a lot of opportunities in the Bahamas. You could go catch yellowtails, you can catch muttons, you can fish for king mackerel, you can high speed troll for wahoo, you can go bone fishing, which now you need a license for, by the way. Um, nevertheless, there are a lot of different things that you can do, but you decide that you want to go target queen snapper. This is a completely different animal, different mindset completely than the tuna. And we're going to go back to the tuna because let me tell you something. I love deep dropping, personally. I love it, especially in the Bahamas for queen snappers. But it's hard, hard for a group of four to six people on one boat to go deep dropping with one rod for eight hours and to not do anything else. Those other people who are not on the rod are going to start to really quick. Okay, I'm telling you. And so eventually, you're going to have to do something else. So when we go over and go deep dropping in the Bahamas, first of all, we're always fishing two rods. Okay, we're not fishing one. We're always fishing two rods. As far as what tackle we use, there's absolutely no question or doubt in my mind that the finest deep drop reel on the market is the Lingren Pittman S1200. There are certainly some other products out there that are good, and a lot of guys love them. I fish the, the LP, and when I'm queen snapper fishing, I fish the LP. Okay, you could get away with a Daiwa Tanacom 1000 or the Shimano, because you're really only fishing in 800 to 1200 feet of water. You could get away with a lighter electric reel that's a little bit more comfortable. But deep dropping for queen snapper is not about sport. It's fun. Deep dropping's fun, requires skill and energy and effort, and it's very rewarding, but it's not really the sportiest thing in the world, okay? Either way, you're cranking them up, so to speak, with an electric reel. So I want to use the best reel that's the most reliable that I could get that fish up and in the boat with and then get that rig back down to the bottom and try and catch another one or two more. So when we are deep dropping, as I mentioned, everybody familiar with the LPS 1200, the big, beautiful, gray deep drop reel? They're giving one away tonight with the raffle, right, Marsha? <laughs> yeah, now everybody's staying. Okay. You know, I'll see if I can work that out. Anyhow, okay. so. We're fishing a pretty beefy deep drop rod. Again, something that has a soft tip rated for 60 to 100 pound line or even 80 to 100 pound. You want to be able to detect those bites and you will see the bites. You know, even though you're fishing a big heavy rod, you're fishing it out of the rod holder, the line on the reel could be as light as 50 pound or as heavy as 80 pound. You really don't have to fish heavier than 80 pound braid. Daytime sword fishing, okay? We're targeting fish out here that could exceed 500 pounds on 65 pound braid, okay? And even lighter. Now that we're doing direct drops, there's guys doing direct drops with 40 pound braid for swordfish, okay? The stuff is incredible. It's not gonna break as long as it's not damaged. But again, a fine line, you know, or I should say a balance, 50 pound on the light side, 80 pound on the heavy side. The thinner that line is, of course, it's going to cut through the water easier. You're going to need less lead to hold the bottom. Okay, You're going to see the bites better. You're going to have an overall more successful experience. Understand that when you are deep dropping for less, uh, I don't want to say less worthy, but for silky snapper, queen snap, I mean, uh, yellow eyes, you can fish spots that are in four to 800 feet of water. But if you are specifically targeting the highly coveted, beautifully colored queen snapper, okay, the, the queen of the deep, beautiful red crimson color, I mean, that's got to be one of the prettiest fish in the ocean. If you're not sure what they look like, Google queen snapper, okay, and you will see. You're fishing deep water, especially for the bigger ones. You're fishing 800 to 1200 feet of water. 
we often can get away with five pounds of lead. However, you may need up to 10 pounds of lead. And guess what else lives 1,200 feet down on the bottom that also inhabits the same structure and the same habitat as the queen snapper? Grupa. Big, big grouper. It is not uncommon to hook a 50 to 100 pound grouper. Okay? Now, that's a fish of a lifetime, isn't it? I mean, a hundred pound giant big old grouper. Okay, you want to be, you know, you went, you went, you ran 90 miles one way to Lukaya. You spent hundreds, if not thousands, on fuel, ice, bait, food, this, that. You checked in 300 bucks. Your hotel is hundreds of bucks. You know, you spent a lot of money. That hundred pound trophy fish, man, I don't want to lose that guy. I don't want to lose that guy. And I know he's a possibility, okay? Not a guarantee, but a possibility in these waters. There are big groupers. We've caught them and you'll catch them if you put in enough time. So you've got to fish a heavier rod. And again, that's why we're fishing at LP on a, you know, like a daytime swordfish rod, a heavy duty deep drop rod. That's our choice of equipment when we're deep dropping in that deep water. Our line, as I mentioned, has to be braid. Do not fish monofilament. Don't even think about it. Braid offers way too many advantages in this venue that you just don't need to fish mono. At the end of my braid, I have a top shot. I do not tie my braid directly to my rig. I've got at least 50 feet of 100 pound mono. Okay, 50 feet of 100 pound mono. That acts as a shock absorber. There's some give there. Because remember, I'm dropping a rig potentially 1,200 feet to the bottom. I potentially could hook one, two, three, or even up to five fish, because I'm fishing a five hook rig. You need some give. The boat's going up and down. And at the bottom of your rig, you're not only fighting those fish, but what do you have at the bottom of the rig? A five to 10 pound lead that's pulling this way. So there's so many different things that are happening there with braid with so little stretch, something's gonna give. Something's gonna give and you're gonna pull hooks, you're gonna bust off rigs, you need that elasticity. You need that shock absorber. So tie in at least 50 feet of 100 pound mono. You can go 130, but you don't have to. 100 pound is perfect. From there, our rig is very clean, very simple. Now you can buy deep drop rigs already made up that are really fancy and have glow beads and glow squid and this and that, and they work. And they've got these big metal claw-like hooks. Everybody know what I'm talking about? I'm sure they have them here and at all of the tackle shops. They work and you'll catch fish with them. Yeah, he's holding one up right there, okay? Not what I fish with. I prefer to tie my own rigs, okay? I like to, the stealthy, clean approach. It's a five hook rig. You can kind of see, I'll do it like this. This is the bottom of the rig. That's my weight, which could vary from five to 10 pounds. There's some key elements to this rig that are really important. You see that sinker spinning like that? That, set, that lead, that sash weight will spin 1,200 feet down and 1,200 feet up. And if there is no swivel connecting that sinker, your rig will look like a pretzel. Okay, it'll literally be all twisted up by, let me tell you, it might not be on the first drop or even on the second drop. Catch a couple fish and then look at that rig. It's gonna be shot. It'll be completely a mess. So make sure that, again, there's a big snap swivel right on the bottom. Now, if you'd like, you can have, instead of having the lead right on the snap, you can have the lead connected to, say, a piece of 30-pound monofilament. In case the lead gets hung up in the bottom, you don't lose your whole rig because, of course, that 30-pound monofilament is going to break before my 300-pound leader breaks. You get this stuck in the bottom, this isn't breaking. It's 300-pound test, okay, 300-pound. So you can do that. You can put a little bit of monofilament in between there. One, I don't want to use the word trick, but one thing that I like to do is I not only put a light on the top of my rig, I put a strobe on the bottom of the rig. So I have a light on the top and a light on the bottom. And as this is dragging across the bottom, silt is being you know, disturbed. It almost looks like a feeding scenario unfolding, like shrimp or squid or crabs or bait fish or something going on down there. There's lights flashing, there's silt being you know, brought up. 
anything in the area is going to be attracted to it, right? They're going to sniff it out. They're going to look at it and go, hey, I got to go check that out. That could be a potential food source. And maybe I'm getting a little bit too deep thinking like fish, but I think if you want to catch fish, you got to think like a fish, right? I mean, he's looking around. There's nothing going around anywhere. Then way out there, there's a couple of lights flashing. Something's going on. There's some activity. He's a predator. He's going to go check it out. And when he goes over there, he's going to find five squid, five whole squid hanging off my rig that are all swimming nice and naturally, you know, really clean, all flowing in the water, five squid. I'm hoping he's going to eat one of those squid, okay? <laughs> now, keep in mind, you don't have to fish whole squid. Everybody says barracuda is a great deep drop bait. It certainly is. Bonita, really anything fresh, any cut bait will work. These are bottom fish. It's a snapper. Snapper will eat almost everything, right? I mean, they'll eat crabs, they'll eat, they'll eat everything. But I have found that a whole like six to eight inch squid is the ideal bait when it comes to chasing queen snappers. If you're looking for the smaller stuff, this isn't the right rig, that's not the right bait. If you're looking for the big, big groupers, tell you what, take a whole bonita and fillet the whole side and put the whole side of the bonita on the hook. Okay, because the big groupers will suck that up. Seriously, a whole fillet from a bonita. But again, that's not what this seminar is about. It's about queen snappers. So in turn, the whole squid has been, you know, the, really the most successful day in and day out. Hook to squid, it's a 9-0 VMC inline circle hook. You absolutely have to fish circle hooks on your deep drop rigs because you are not going to set the hook into that fish. You've got to let the hook do what it was designed to do. Again, a 9-0 thin wire. It's a big, strong hook. It can handle that 100-pound grouper. Right? That hook can handle that 100-pound grouper that you may hook while you're targeting those queen snappers. So you certainly want to be ready for that as well. Really good quality hook, 300 pound leader. It's a stiff rig. In other words, it's very easy to handle. It's hard to twist, hard to tangle, and it's strong because remember, you may have multiple fish on here pulling in multiple different directions. Plus, queen snappers, a thousand feet below the surface, are not very line shy, okay? It's pitch black. They're not very line shy. They don't see if this is 300 or 100. For the love of God, there's deep drop rigs that are made on 600 pound test, okay? On the trunk line, and then the branches are a little bit lighter. They're not line shy, so you're not dealing with that scenario, you know, with line shy fish, so you might as well tie a stronger rig. Like I said, you can purchase them off the shelf. You can make them yourselves. I use these little sleeve swivels. This is a little swivel that slides on the actual trunk line. So once you slide this swivel on your main trunk line, you can position it anywhere on your trunk line and simply crimp it into position. It's very simple, very convenient, allows you to really customize a deep drop rig. The only disadvantage to doing it this way versus a typical three-way swivel deep drop rig where if you lose for example, a branch, if this busts right here and breaks because a shark cut it off and you lost part of your rig, it's much more challenging to fix this rig. You'll have to salvage the parts, you know, the hooks, because everything else is toast. If you're using three-way swivels, it's easy to just connect one section to another. So there's benefits to both, okay? Where am I looking for the queens? Listen, this is a deep water, predator that is structure oriented, okay? They also have this really cool thing called a tail and they move a lot. Groupers tend to hang under ledges, okay? And on drop-offs and caves even. The queen snapper is more of a schooling fish, more of a, almost like, I don't wanna say a glorified yellowtail snapper, but, but somewhat similar in its feeding habits, okay? It's a hunting fish. It will come off the bottom. It is not uncommon to hook queen snappers 50 feet off the bottom, okay? Yes, your rig is directly on the bottom. That's where you wanna target these fish. But again, it is not uncommon for them to swim way up off the bottom. But structure is the key. Now, if you're in Bimini, if you're staying in Bimini, there are some really productive queen snapper spots 
10 to 14 miles north of Bimini in 800 to 1200 feet of water is a series of humps. And I'm not talking about one. There's a whole series of humps out there, which is nice because not every hump will hold fish every day. Okay. And you got to go hump, 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 and you got to jump from one spot to the next. Now, depending on the conditions, you may set up, for example, south of the hump, drift right across it, drift next to it. You want to be as close to that structure as possible because a lot of those fish hold really tight to the structure. And I've had scenarios where I was on the winning and the losing end of this, where there are two boats fishing and one is right there. You could take a baseball and throw it over there and hit his boat. Okay. And this guy is wrecking him. And this guy is watching this guy wreck him. Okay. Wondering why he's not because he's not on the spot because it really can make that big of a difference. It's location, location, location when it comes to deep dropping. So it's very important that you focus your efforts on those small key areas that these fish orientate to, that they hold to. It's security for the bait, it's security for the fish. That's where they live, that's where they breed, that's, that's where they are. That's where I wanna put my bait. I don't wanna put my bait 100 yards over there, even though it's close. That's not close enough. So make sure you have a good sounder, do your homework before you go over there. But again, I'm telling you that if you're staying in Bimini, just north, 10 miles or so, right there is a good series of humps that hold a lot of uh, queen snappers. You could go further. You could go up around the corner, okay, to areas like, you know, people have heard the areas, the hens and chickens, okay. There's a lot of spots up there, deep drop spots up there that are going to be north of Bimini around the corner where you're now going to be going into the Northwest Providence Channel. If you're not understanding, you know, or visualizing what I'm talking about, I highly suggest that at some point tonight when you get home, as a matter of fact, make it a priority. First thing you do when you get home, okay, Google it, like I said, and look at that overlay of the Bahamas, and you'll have that visual picture of exactly what I've been talking about all night. Talking so, Isaac? yes, absolutely. Offshore of Isaacs, okay, is some great deep drop spots. So that's if you're staying in Bimini. If you're staying in West End, I found the best queen snapper spots to be up toward memory, up around the corner, about 15 to 18 miles north of West End. So you ran to West End, and now you've got to go another 15 to 20 miles to get to the best deep drop spots for queen snappers. However, you already went there, and you're really not adding 20 miles to your trip, because remember, you're there from Thursday to Sunday. So you're really only going on a 15 mile run each way. You know what I'm saying? Look at it that way. Especially when you get to the fuel dock. Just look at it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Soften it up a bit. Anyhow, you can certainly go right out front of West End. And you know, I found, I've tried some spots and caught some juvenile queens, but the big ones, the big ones, the beautiful queen snappers are gonna be further away from West End, up around the corner. Again, that magic depth seems to be the 800 to 1200 feet. There's a lot of pinnacles out there. Obviously, you, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and go right down this GPS number. Hurry up, write it down. Two six. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> right. The point I'm making, you got to do your homework, right? And you got to do the research and do it yourself. Certainly it's a good idea to talk to some friends, but you know, good queen snapper deep drop numbers are highly guarded secrets. Highly guarded. Guys will not give those up easily. I, on the other hand, was just joking with you because the truth of the matter is I will give you some numbers. I didn't bring my list right here to share with everybody, but certainly if you would like some numbers, I'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction. Why? Because you're not taking fish away from me. They're there. I want you to go. I want you to catch them like I said in the beginning of the seminar. You're not going to go there and deplete the population of queen snapper and suddenly there's not going to be any more when I go there. That's not going to happen. For all I know, the fish aren't even going to be on the spot that I give you, okay, because they move. But if you have 15 to 20 spots and you go from spot to spot to spot to spot, eventually you will hit pay dirt and some of those spots will hold fish. That's, that's an absolute guarantee, okay. 
But again, it's in the details. You got to do it the right way with the right tackle, the right bait, paying attention, depending on the current. If there's no current at all, go to a five pound lead. If there's current, if there's a breeze and a lot of current and you're moving fast, go to a heavier sash weight because you got to keep that rig in the strike zone. Sometimes that requires literally paying out line. You know, in other words, you're drifting for three, four minutes, five minutes, you don't get a bite, you pop the reel into free spool and you could feel that rig drop. You could feel it drop and you're like, one, two, three, four, boom, it just hit. Was your rig on the bottom? Nope, you were off the bottom, okay? You got this giant boa line, even though you think your rig, you know, your line's going straight down from the rod tip. You're watching, it's going straight down. You're in 1,200 feet of water. Do you think your rig is right there? Your rig is whoo, way out there way out there, okay? So there's a lot happening, the dynamics, there's a lot happening between your rig and that rod right there. But you've got to do everything you can to keep that rig as close to the bottom as possible. If there's a lot of breeze or a lot of current and you're really having a hard time holding the bottom, hit the bottom, pop the reel into free spool and just keep paying out line. Just keep paying out line as the boat's drifting. Don't, don't look for a bite, don't do anything, nice and slow, just keep paying out line, drift for five minutes, lock it up, and hit the button. And if you were on any fish, they're gonna be hooked up right there. So there, you know, you've, again, you've gotta be ready to modify your approach based on what you're doing. If you're staying in Lukaya, okay, off that area, there's a lot of deep drop spots just south of Lukaya. That water gets really deep, really fast. And those same canyons, the close canyons in that five to seven mile range, there's a lot of good deep drop spots there for queens and even especially groupers, okay? I certainly, like I said, would be more than happy to get you started, but it's all about that structure. Some of those pinnacles too there are amazing. It's like you're drifting along and then you look at your machine and it looks like a pin that comes off the bottom for a hundred feet, literally looks like a pin, like the Empire State Building just coming off the bottom for a hundred feet high. You know, what a great spot that is. Currents hitting it, the baits hitting it, you know. So some of the spots though aren't that prevalent, you know, or aren't that predominant, where it isn't this giant peak that's so obvious. It might just be a 10 foot ledge, just a little 10 foot ledge. Okay, and guess what? That's all that takes, that 10 foot ledge, because if you're out in this wide open desert and there's one palm tree that's five feet high, where am I gonna be? I'm laying under that palm tree, okay? I don't care if it's only five feet high. It's the only thing for miles. That's where I'm gonna be, okay? So it's, sometimes it doesn't take a lot to attract a lot. So pay very close attention, one eye on that machine, on that sounder, the entire time you're drifting and fishing. And obviously, the better of a fish finder you have with a more powerful transducer, potentially chirp, okay, not necessary, but potential in that sort of environment when you're focusing on the bottom, you know, really quality equipment plays a role here. Also, make sure that you zoom into the bottom on your screen, okay? Make sure that you zoom into that bottom so you can see, because you don't care what's happening in the top 800 feet, if I'm in 900 feet of water, I don't care what's happening in the top 800 feet. I want a clear picture of what's happening in the bottom 100 feet if I'm deep dropping in that scenario. So you go out in the morning, you know, and you went deep dropping wherever area you were staying in, like I said, and then you can't do that all day. You're only allowed to keep how many bottom fish? Somebody tell me, and we'll use the term demersal. A demersal fish is a bottom fish, snapper, grouper. How many bottom fish are you allowed to keep in the Bahamas? It's funny, I don't hear a lot of things, you know, being said. Okay, the reason you guys aren't saying a lot is because it's so damn confusing, isn't it? It's like, how many fish am I allowed to keep? And every year it's a little bit different. You know, it's been the same for years, but you just don't know. You are allowed 20, 20 bottom fish or 60 pounds. Okay, not queens. No, 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 total. 20 bottom fish or 60 pounds total. So listen to what I'm saying for a second, whichever is greater, 20 fish or 60 pounds. If you drop to the bottom and you catch a 50 pound grouper, okay? No, you know, let's say it a different way. You went 
snapper fishing and you caught 20 queen snapper. You load it up and now it's time to come home and you say, I want to do one more drop. And you drop down and you catch a 50 pound grouper. What has to happen? Throw a snapper away. Throw a snapper away. <laughs> snapper is my next bait, you know. For starters, yes, because you cannot exceed 20 fish. That's number one. You can't have 20 fish. So this is really important because if you go there thinking you're smart and say, you know, we're going to go yellowtail fishing. Okay, we're going to go catch some yellowtail tonight on a reef in the Bahamas during our weekend blast, and you catch 18 yellowtail snapper. And then you go queen snapper fishing and deep dropping, and you catch those two or three, and you exceed your limit. Again, you're exceeding the limit. I'm not suggesting you throw those small yellowtail back, but that's obviously what anybody would do. That's what's called culling. Okay, that's what they call it. So you've got to be very careful that you don't exceed the numbers, okay, or the size. And, and of course, it's always going to be 20 fish usually is going to be greater than 60 pounds. Okay? You cannot keep any grouper in the Bahamas that's not a minimum of three pounds. It has to be a minimum of three pounds for any grouper. There's no size limit on the queen snappers. Okay? But you can't exceed 20. You can fillet the fish, but you have to keep the skin on the fillet. You can eat fish while you're in the Bahamas, so you can catch 20 today, and you can say, and by the way, understand, for you to go to the Bahamas and catch 20 trophy queen snapper, I praise you, okay? Because you're dialed in. You, you got it dialed in. And it's not that easy. It really isn't. These fish are not, again, it's not that easy. Catching 20 small yellowtail snapper on a reef isn't that hard. Going to the Bahamas and catching 20 big queen snappers is a feat. That's an accomplishment. And I'll tell you, you go to the Bahamas and catch 20 queen snapper and 18 yellowfin tuna, oh my God, you, ju you just had the greatest trip in the world. You limited out, okay? You literally limited out. That's a phenomenal trip. Anybody ever do that? That would be a zero, okay? A zero. That, that just shows you how hard it is to really accomplish that. You know, you go, when you go queen snapper fishing, again, you're fishing in deep water. It takes a long time just to bring that fish up from 1,200 feet because, you, you know, you're taking your time. That's a long time. And then once you get that fish up toward the surface, you bring it up in the boat. Everybody's admiring it. You're jumping for joy. Shots all around, okay? Whatever it is, you're taking pictures. You're doing whatever. Now you've got to rebate the rig, drop it back to the bottom. It's almost like an hour ordeal. Okay, it almost feels like an hour ordeal to catch one fish. Certainly it can be done quicker than that, but it feels like that. That's also why we fish two rods. Okay, so there's always a rod on the bottom. Okay, there's always a rig on the bottom as you're going like this. Nevertheless, you go out and you catch three, four nice queens, be happy. You catch seven or eight nice queens, be double as happy. But don't expect to light the world on fire. Don't think you're just going to slay 18 big giant queen snappers. Not to say it's impossible, but it certainly is challenging. They're just not that abundant, okay, and not that dumb. But fish all of those spots. Spend a lot of time doing that. You're only going to do that for so long before your wife, girlfriend, buddy, kids, whoever it is says, I really had enough of watching you have a good time on that deep drop rod while I sit here and do nothing, okay? Because there's nothing for me to do on this center console. My phone doesn't work. You know, there's nothing for me to do. And I'm tired of watching you catch. Take me back, okay? I want to go swimming. I want to eat. I want to do whatever. So at some point, you've got to throw in the towel. You did your deep dropping. And now, of course, you've got to go back to, you know, wherever you're, you're staying. And it's a good idea to do so because it's time to rest, relax, and regroup. Because guess what we're doing this afternoon? We're going tuna fishing. Okay? And that's what a, a Bahamas weekend yellowfin tuna queen snapper blast is all about. It's about the timing, you know, when to do what to do. You know, knowing how to do it is one thing. Knowing when to do it is a completely different thing. And it's important that you do the right thing at the right time in order to maximize your efforts, in order to maximize your success ratio. So we go back, we relax, we unwind. Now we're going tuna fishing again. And again, we may not have any live bait, that's okay. Well, we brought slabs and slabs and slabs of chunk bait. And what we do is you could buy 
you know, you go to a local tackle shop, I'm sure in Marshall's Bait Freezer right there, who'd be more than happy to sell you 37 pound boxes of sardines. Okay, I'm sure he would be happy to do so. Or you could potentially, I don't, I don't know if they sell them here, but you could buy bait in 25 pound slabs. Cheaper, more bait. That's what I would recommend when you're going over to the Bahamas if you're not going to bring live bait with you. Bring a lot of chunks. And what we like to do is we chunk them here, not there. We fill five gallon buckets with lids. We pack those five gallon buckets in ice and we have giant fish holds on our CV and it gives us the ability to do that. So this way we're not farting around with cutting bait while we're in the Bahamas. Okay, who wants to do that? I want to fish. I want to relax. I want to go there well prepared. Trust me, I'm going to use the chunks. Okay, that's why we're going there, to tuna fish. So as the trip progresses, you look at how much bait you have left based on what you've caught, and you know how to balance that bait. You turn around and say, well, slow down on how much you're throwing. We're still going to be fishing tomorrow. We got one fish in the box. I need that bait, okay, because this just isn't fa you know, panning out today. On the other hand, we've crushed them. We still got two buckets of bait. Throw the shit, whatever. Okay, we've got them, we, we, you know, success. So you've got to balance all of that right. So here it is that, you know, now it's Friday night. We spent the day after we got up, we went deep dropping, we caught some queens. Now it's time to go tuna fishing again. And we know what happened last night. We went out last night, we fished those canyons. We didn't see a single fish or a single bird. We didn't see anything. You know what I'm going to do tonight? Before I even leave the dock, before I even think about leaving the dock, I'm going on a hunting mission. I'm going to look for every other guy in a center console or a boat that's anywhere near me, and I'm going to talk to him. And I'm going to approach that guy, and I'm going to go, hi, hey, what's up? Hey, listen, I went tuna fishing last night. I ran here. I did this. I went there. This is what I caught. Nothing. I'm not going to ask him for information. I'm going to give him information. Okay, that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to be courteous and I'm going to tell him in all honesty exactly what happened to me. I'm not going to be embarrassed to say I didn't catch anything. Anybody ever go fishing and not catch a single fish? <laughs> Whoever's not raising their hand is lying. Okay, it happens to everybody. It's fishing. So in turn, before I go out again tonight, I want to increase the odds in my favor. I'm going to do a little research, okay? I'm going to talk. I'm going to help other guys, and I'm going to pick their brain. Hey, you guys fishing? What did you see? Where did you go? Did you go east? Did you go west? Did you go south? Well, how many miles? Blah, 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 blah. I'll, I'll talk to my head turns blue, okay? Because I'm there. I want as much information as I could possibly get. And you're only one boat. One boat in a big ocean. So it's important to be able to network with other guys that are there to get the scoop on what's been going on. Some people may say to you, dude, yeah, they're out there on that edge, but they don't pop up until 8 p.m. You know, at 7.30 I left because I fished for three and a half hours and never saw a single bird, and I'm running home and the fish are now just popping up. And where you only have that one magic hour between 8 and 9 p.m. to catch those fish, because that's how yellowfin tuna are. They turn on and off like a light switch, okay? On and off. You can read them sometimes, too. I'll, I'll never forget them. I'm going way, way back, over 20 years ago, ran a headboat, fished the canyons for yellowfin tunas up in the northeast. We used to anchor up in 2,000 feet of water, okay? Drop an anchor in 2,000 feet of water where we knew those yellowfins would be. And we would chunk. We had 30 guys on the boat. We're fishing for 30 hours straight. We would chunk, and you would see as the, the day or evening progressed, you'd see the elephants come under the boat, but they wouldn't bite. But you'd see them, see them clear as day, whole line of them nonstop, like a parade of tuna coming under the boat. You got 30 guys on the boat jigging and fishing bait, and nobody's catching anything. And suddenly, for no apparent reason, I have no, no idea why, but something changed. Something happened. And suddenly you go from 30 guys that are really bored, not catching anything, to 22 of those 30 guys hooked up to yellowfin tuna. And the bite just explodes. And they stay fired up and they eat and then, boom, they shut off. Four hours later, okay, for whatever reason or whatever amount of time. Tuna is a tuna. That's how yellowfin tuna are, okay? A tuna is a tuna, especially the yellowfins. And that's how they act. So. You know, they're not always feeding, even though they're there, doesn't mean that you're going to catch them. But certainly the birds are indicating that something is happening, that there are some fish, obviously tuna, potentially, 
pushing bait up toward the surface. So there's activity happening and the birds are a great indicator. Nevertheless, I've networked with the guys and I realize I'm going to the wrong place. I'm going to the wrong place. They're not even down here. Nobody's been catching them down here. They're catching them over there. I gotta go 10 miles to the west. That's where everybody's catching them. And I'm okay with that because I'm there for Thursday, Friday. I got all day Saturday as well. I'm not coming home until Sunday. And I promise you, I'm not gonna fish on the way home either. Okay? So in turn, I'm now just getting dialed in. I know I've accepted the fact okay, that not every time I leave that dock and not every flock of birds is it all going to come together. It's not going to happen. To me, you know how I judge that Bahamas weekend trip? I judge it when I go, bye, hi, when I leave there and I come home and I open that fish box and go, okay, this was the results of our trip. And those results may happen on the very last drop that you do. Okay, it may be Saturday evening because it took you two days to get dialed in. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it could happen. Okay, but as long as you pay attention along the way and do your work and really take it seriously, somewhere during that period, you're going to find success. How much success? Well, that's going to depend on your abilities, your fish fighting skills, the tackle you have on the boat, and the people you have on the boat. You know, there's the guys that go day tripping again that's what we call it where you get up at the crack you, you get up you leave you know here at 6 a.m and you run over wide open you know even 5 a.m you leave here and you get there because you want to be the first guy at customs and immigration to check in and that guy shows up at 9 a.m and he's in no rush because he's on bahamas time okay he doesn't care that you've been up for hours and hours and that you just ran 90 miles to get here to go tuna fishing, he doesn't care. Nevertheless, these guys are serious. They're teams of anglers, crews, who are all about catching these tunas. They went over there, they've got hundreds if not thousands, literally, of live pilchards blacked out in all of their bait wells. They run over there, they check in, they run out to the, to the canyons, they run out to the areas where the yellowfins are, they look for the birds and they fish all day. And when they're done, when either one of two things has happened, they caught 18, that's one. Two, they're out of bait, okay? Or three, they decide, hey, it's 7 p.m. and we've been fishing for 12 hours straight or however long it is, it's time to go home. And then they turn around and they run 90 miles back in one day, okay? That's called day tripping. It's got benefits. You don't need a hotel, okay? It has downsides. You only have one day to figure it all out and to, to really you know, catch the fish. But again, it's because they jump from pod to pod to pod. Oftentimes when those birds are up, it's not like here. Oh look, a frigate, one frigate, 250 feet up, circling around, and seven boats trying to get underneath that one frigate. Uh, am I wrong? right that that's here okay there i'm telling you it's flocks of birds you know when they're really feeding it's this giant flock of birds it's like super exciting it's like national geographic kind of stuff you know you spot them for miles away and, and like i said super fired up so we decided okay well we're going to run that way tonight you know where we believe they're going to be and we leave at well it's up to you on how long you want to fish but really with a fast boat how long, you're flagged, dude, there's no more beer for you. Okay, how far, you know, how far do you want to run? When you're doing 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, it doesn't take you very long to get to where you're going, okay, especially at 50, you know, it doesn't take you very long. And you don't need to fish for eight hours. So really you could essentially, and we've done this many, many times, especially when we're dialed in, we know, well, the last two nights in a row, those fish have popped up eight and a half miles from the cut. So we know we could be eight and a half miles in about eight and a half minutes. Okay, of course a little bit more than that, but not much more. So you could leave at six o'clock and fish 6.30 to 8.30. You only need a couple hours to catch those tunas. Okay? Once you approach those birds, we already talked about setting up in the right spot and getting ahead of them. A couple other things you can do, we talked about the conventional outfit. However, you certainly can target and catch yellowfin tuna on spinning rods. You just have to have the right spinning rod. 
This is a heavy vertical jigging rod, okay? It's rated for up to 400 grams, which is like something like 15 ounces. Okay, all you weed dealers out there know exactly what that is, but whatever. Okay, it's very, very beefy. It's matched to a Daiwa size 7,000 Isla reel, okay? And it's loaded with 60 pound braid. There's like 500 yards of 60 pound braid on here. But it's got a ton of drag, a ton of line capacity, and a ton of drag. It's very comfortable and light to fish versus, for example, the conventional outfit. Are you going to beat, you know, pound for pound, are you going to beat a 50 pound yellowfin on this rod as fast as you could beat a 50 pound yellowfin on the bent butt rod? No. The bent butt rod's going to beat you every time. But this is very sporty. It's a lot of fun. Obviously, we don't fish that braid directly to the hook, as I mentioned earlier. There's a top shot on here, fluorocarbon or monofilament, right to a 7.0 VMC live bait tuna hook. There it is, right there. Very stealthy, no swivels, no anything. Put a live pilchard on there. I can chuck this out away from the boat a little ways, and I just feed it out as fast as I can and let that bait get away from the boat. If it's a chunk, same thing, I'm gonna feed it out. Let them get away from the boat. I could fish a short, stout rod because I'm not counting on this spinning rod for distance, right? And I don't want this giant, soft tip I want the sturdiness that this beefy rod offers me so I can get that yellowfin tuna in the boat. There's this whole rack of reels here. You could probably catch yellowfin tuna with anything in that entire rack, you know? I mean, again, there's so many options when it comes to tackle. And it's really whatever you have and whatever works for you. But again, there's a lot of options. And then finally, what could potentially be the most exciting thing in all of fishing is throwing giant poppers at surface busting fish. In any scenario, whenever you see fish busting on top, if your heart doesn't skip a beat, you should be golfing, okay? Because <laughs> fishing isn't for you. When you see fish busting water, and you know, you got this birds everywhere, the birds are screaming, you can't even hear yourself talk, there's white water everywhere, and you know you know when you chuck this baby and you start popping it across the top, you're getting bit. You know you're gonna get bit, okay? It's impossible for you not to get bit because it looks like a wounded bait fish. You're, you know, you're, you're splashing it across the surface. So there are a few things that are more exciting than popping for yellowfin tuna. It is something that's very popular around the rigs off Louisiana. I'm sure you guys have heard of guys catching big yellowfin tuna up there on poppers. Costa Rica? Anybody ever hear of Costa Rica? Okay, cool little place, Costa Rica it is. And you can pop yellowfin tuna there all of the time. Panama, of course, these foreign destinations on the Pacific coast, and also in the Bahamas. Not a lot of guys do it, because what happens is when you throw this popper and you start popping it across the surface, guess what happens? Big old black fins jump on it before the yellow fin can even see it and get to it because those black fins are closer to the surface. But doesn't mean that you won't have that shot at a yellow fin. In this particular case, we fish a heavier rod. Okay, it's a longer rod, it's eight foot. You can fish 40, 50 pound braid on here easily. This is a Daiwa Saltiga. It's called the dog fight. Okay, the dog fight. If you're gonna fish for yellow fin tuna with a spinning reel, give me something called the dog fight, okay? Because you need something that's got a lot of line capacity and a lot of drag. And for 1200 bucks, this thing better be able to stop a tow truck, okay? I'm just telling you right now. This is not the place, popping yellowfin tuna is not the place for $129 spinning reels, okay? It just isn't, you know, they don't have enough drag. The handle will break in your hand. It will break right off the reel. You'll go to crank and you'll be like, now what do I do? Okay, it will happen to you with inferior tackle. I am not kidding you. So, that, you know, you're running over there, you're spending all this time and energy, you better make sure your tackle is up to par and heavy duty gear for these heavy duty fish. So we approach those birds on that Friday evening and now it pays off for us. Again, we're working together as a team. We're chunking. We've hooked a couple big yellow fins. We've caught some black fins too. We're having a grand old time. We get those fish in the boat. We bleed them. We ice them. 
things couldn't be better. We're on Bahama time. We're loving life. We run back in. Now the rum was really flowing, okay? Because now success is here. We did it. We caught them. Then, of course, you have all of Saturday to repeat the entire process again at your pace, at your level. Do you want to go do more deep dropping or do you want to, you know, spend that evening again tuna fishing? That's what I like to do. You turn it into multiple trips during the same one big trip. So you give yourself a lot of different options, a lot of different chances. It gives you plenty of time to get dialed in. Sunday morning comes around, okay, you're absolutely exhausted. You've slept very little, you've drank awful lot, okay. You've caught a bunch of fish, you've put hundreds of miles on the boat going back and forth and all kinds of good stuff. And now it's time to go home. I suggest what I like to do. I'm one of those guys where when it's time to go home, I want to go home. I don't want to sit around while you're having bacon and eggs, okay, when I got 94 miles to run home. I don't care you want a toasted bagel. Okay, I really don't. I want to go home. Okay, because I want to go home. We're done. I got a big boat to clean. I got a lot of fish to clean, a lot of tackle to put away. I got a long way to go. I don't want to deal with the afternoon storms that typically come up in the summertime. You know, it's usually beautiful, but our pattern, we know what our pattern is. Come three, four, five o'clock, you could potentially be coming back and there's that long, really thick line of thunderstorms that's pushing out and you got nowhere to go, and it's no fun. I've been caught in those and said, batten down the hatches, baby, there's only one way to go, and that's right through it. That's it. I'm not gonna sit here like a dead duck. I'm not gonna turn around and go back and run and hide, okay? I'm going. So put on your rain jacket, get out of that little bean bag that you've been comfortable in while I've been driving, okay? Because I know how that works. Let me tell you, as, you guys know what I'm talking, I'm 90 miles, I'm driving, they're sleeping in bean bags. Okay, it's not fair, but anyhow, and you run through it. So I like to leave early, I really do. And then again, early bird gets the worm because as I'm running home, there's some birds. <clears throat> you know, might need to check that out. Okay, there's that whatever. You know, you got a long way to go, and depending on what you caught, obviously you can make your decision there. So you run back in. You get back into your inlet safely. You know, you obviously had, obviously had the trip of a lifetime. You learned a lot. You can't wait to go back. You know, you had an opportunity to jig some fish, pop some fish, catch some fish on bait, whatever it may be. You run back to your inlet. You get to the dock. You tie the boat up. You run in the house. You pick up your cell phone. You call me and go, thanks, Mike. I just had a great, great time, and I can't wait to go back. Okay? That's what Bahamas fishing is really all about. It's so much more, though, than just the fishing. It's the people, the food, the culture, and it's the fact that you're literally a world away in just a couple hours. A world away. And it's not a couple hour plane flight. It's a couple hours on your boat, you know? And even when you're on your boat, how much fun are you having? The music is blaring, your, your, your family, your friends, you know, you're really relaxing. But for the whole trip to really be successful, You've got to plan it appropriately. You've got to have some spare parts on the boat too, spare tackle. Don't think you're getting anything there, because you're not. You can, but don't count on it. Don't think, oh, you know, I need a, you know, a whatever for my whatever, because you're not going to find that whatever for your whatever, okay? It's going to be, and you don't want to be looking for it. So make sure that you bring a spare of everything that you need. Finally, a couple other things I want to talk about real quick, and then we'll wrap this up here. Okay, it's already been a couple hours. Trolling, okay, you absolutely control for yellowfin tuna and catch yellowfin tuna in the Bahamas. One of my buddies, who is a very, very coincidentally, a very, very big fan of chaos from years ago, he used to have this trick that he did that I thought was just awesome. And I tried it and it worked for me too. I don't need to do it and I'll explain why, but some of you may need to do it. He ran a small boat with no outriggers. Okay, he had like a 27-foot center console, but he didn't have outriggers at all. And he used to come back, and he caught a lot of yellowfin tuna trolling. But he couldn't fish eight rods, so he couldn't even fish six rods. He fished four. So he took this same lure that has these wings, these little, what, what do you, it's like a bullet, but what do you, do you have a specific name for this lure? Okay, it's a lure with mylar wings. That's the secret name, okay? But nevertheless, he was a giant fan of this particular lure, and I can understand why, because it looks like what? 
just like a flying fish. What the hell are the elephant tunas eating? Flying fish. So he took four rods and he would mark the line because he was a charter boat. He took charters over there and he would mark the line and he would do 100 feet with red nail polish. 100 feet, 150 feet, 200 feet, 250 feet. And he would stagger these. He would have one, two, three, four rods. And he would fish them all right behind the boat. 250 feet, 200, 150, 100. And he would troll with four baits in a straight line right behind the boat. The same lure. They wouldn't tangle because they all swim the same. They're not crossing each other because they're staggered. And the guy would catch a ton of fish. So it's, it's a good method and it shows you that you can troll a really simple spread and really be effective. Now, of course, you have that same guy with the 70-foot Merit that has 58-foot outriggers with four release clips on each, and he's fishing 16 lines, which in reality, keep in mind, he's not because Bahama law states you can only fish with, anyone know? Six lines. Six. You cannot have more than six lines in the water at any one time. So really, that advantage, the big boat advantage, is not so much of an advantage anymore when you're in the Bahamas because the smaller center consoles can easily fish six lines as well. But even if you have no outriggers, you can get in on the trolling as well. I'd highly recommend in every trolling spread in the Bahamas, you know, when you go out in the afternoon and you're searching, you don't know where you're going to find those birds. It's a good idea to troll, isn't it? Let me cover some ground. Let me at least have some baits in the water. I've still got time. It's only four in the afternoon. Let me try and get dialed in as to what's going on. Maybe I pick off a couple 20 pound dolphin. Ooh, what a bummer that would be, okay? Maybe a blue marlin comes up into my spread. How tragic, okay? So in turn, you certainly control. A couple of ballyhoo islander type combinations, a staple, slam dunk staple. No trolling spread should be complete without a couple of ballyhoo and islander type lures, okay? Fresh ballyhoo with an islander type lure over top of it is a staple. Everything eats them. Small little feathers and jets, you know, tuna really like small baits, small streamlined slick baits, small, like this. Not those giant marlin lures that you see on the wall that are 18 inches long. They work great for big blue marlin. They work great for 300 pound cow yellowfin tuna. That's not what you're fishing for over there. So small and streamlined, they could be bullets, they could be little jet heads that have little holes in them. Okay, obviously these little jets with the, you know, these little baits with the mylar wings are perfect. As far as color is concerned, the same colors that dolphin eat, tuna will eat, you know, blue and white, green and white, purple and white, feathers are very effective. And then of course there's another staple. Anybody know what this is called? Why in the world any fish would eat this is beyond me, okay? I mean, look at the damn thing. Does it look like anything that swims? No, but the truth of the matter is it has amazing action in the water. Amazing action in the water with that weighted head, that natural cedar body, okay? It's a very simple lure that is idiot-proof. Just throw it out there. Well, does it need to be on the face of the wave or on the back of the wave or on the third wake or on this? Just throw it out there, okay? Oh, keep put out more line. Get it way, way back there behind the boat, okay? Set it and forget it. Get it way, way back there, put it up in a rod holder and wait for the reel to start singing. That's what a cedar plug is, okay? No trolling spread for tuna would be complete without this staple because it really is a staple are these trolling plugs. Now, one other quick trick and then we'll, we'll wrap this up here. Sometimes when you can't find those birds and you can't find the yellowfin tunas, you need to remember that those yellowfin often associate, as we know, with the blackfin tuna and even with the skipjack tuna, you know, with the other tuna species, okay? And they use those other tuna species for the same reason that they use porpoises, okay? Porpoises, and we all know the association between yellowfin tuna and porpoises. Whenever you see dolphin schools, not mahi-mahi, you know, flipper, wah, wah, wah. whenever you see those guys, chances are in the Bahamas that there are tuna around. Why? Because the porpoises are able to locate the prey much better and more effectively and from a greater distance than the yellowfin tuna can. So the yellowfins are like, hey, I got an idea. Hey, Charlie, let's hang out behind these guys. Wherever they go, we'll follow them. 
okay? Because they're really good at finding the squid and the bait fish. Really, really good at it. So let's just hang out back here and chase those guys around. We exert the least amount of energy, we get the greatest reward. Same thing happens with the black fins that are much more aggressive, they're more plentiful, they're smaller. So in turn, you control a spread of small feathers, like the lures we talked about, and even smaller, like four inch little feathers. You know, you can put six of them out behind a boat. But be ready with your heavier yellow fin outfits. Be ready. Be ready with your chunks. You hook a couple black fins or you hook a couple fish on those feathers. As soon as you hook those fish, slow that boat down. Whoever's the designated chunker, because you've got a guy who knows his job is to throw those chunks. He starts chunking as you're fighting those fish. You get a couple other guys, not a lot, you only need two, to take the heavier rods with the sinkers, with the bigger baits, drop them, drop them down. So as you are bringing those smaller fish in, you are letting your chunks and bait out. You kind of follow me? And oftentimes those yellowfin will come up behind the black fins and you'll be able to hook the bigger fish below those smaller fish.